Well, <clears throat> before I preach the word this morning, I want to, uh, we're going to, there's a group of people leaving for Live Village in KwaZulu-Natal next week um, on an outreach, um, <clears throat> and we want to just pray for them this morning. So um, if you are on part of that team, won't you stand up this morning? If you're part of that team going to Live Village, Live, are you here this morning? Wow. So instead of me calling them forward, I want you, if you're sitting close to them, just Lay your hands on them. We're going to pray for them. There's some of them not here this morning. There's a whole group of them going. They're leaving next Sunday before the church service, and they're going to be there for a week. Uh, and so we want to pray that they will um, serve and love and minister to the people there in a powerful and a relevant way. So, Father, we thank you this morning for the privilege of going beyond the four walls of this building, that we are a church not just in our local area, but we can be relevant and serve in other areas and serve in other places. And we thank you for Live Village. Thank you for what they're doing there, touching the orphans and the mothers with the kingdom message. And as they go, I pray for safe traveling mercies. I pray that you'll give your angels charge over this group as families, that you'll go before them and for Maria God behind them. I pray that as they minister the gospel and serve in a very practical way, that you'll also minister to them and encourage them in the kingdom of God. We thank you for that in the wonderful name of Jesus. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. <clears throat> now, what they've asked me to ask you is if you can't go, and obviously um, you can still be part by donating bean bags. They want to take bean bags with and tennis balls, and then they want to put in a new lawn. And so they're trusting for about 6,000 Rand to buy and uh, replace lawn in a play area. So if you uh, want to participate in the mission, then you could either bring some, where must they bring the tennis balls to the reception area somewhere in this week before next Sunday and some bean bags and make a donation or make a donation towards the buying and planting of a new lawn. We're trusting God for 6,000 rand between them to do that. Amen. Hallelujah. I ministered the word last Sunday on um, a new day of glory and new life, and God ministered to us that He wants to do a new and a fresh thing as, he, as we ministered from that scripture, out of arise, shine, your light has come, and God is saying to us, <clears throat> the reason why we will arise, because there will be a supernatural intervention, the Spirit of God will arise upon us and enable us. And I want to continue along those lines this morning. I want to read two scriptures. I'm going to read several scriptures, but I want to focus on two of them. The first one is in Romans chapter 8. I want to call the word this morning. I will speak to you about shooting the arrow of deliverance. Would you say that with me? The arrow of deliverance. No, you can say it better than that. You sound a bit like the Springboks yesterday, you know. The arrow of deliverance. The arrow of deliverance. Romans 8. Verse, I'm going to read from verse 31, a few verses, and then turn to 2 Kings. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? The original translation, somebody said this to a pastor once that read the scripture to him. He said, Pastor, I don't know about you, but there's a whole lot of things against me. How many of you know there are some things against us? If you've got anything against you, would you raise your hand? Some resistance, some challenges, finances, sickness, relationships, issues. I'm glad I'm preaching to the right crowd. So he said, what then shall we say of these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? And then he looked into the actual original translation that says this. If God is for you, who can be successful against you? It's important, I'm sharing a very important word this morning, that we need to understand that even though we have all the victory that is available in Christ and through Christ, we still have resistance. And you and I need to enforce our victory that has come to us through Christ Jesus. One of the biggest mistakes we can make is to think that because we have the victory, because God has given us victory in and through Jesus, that it should just happen automatically. Now we can't strive and fight for it in our own strength, but there is an effort from our side 
in and through Christ. He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? I shouldn't preach on every verse that I'm reading now. But that's just so exciting. The scripture is so exciting. You know, Jesus, I mean, what a word. This one says, he who did not spare his own son. Uh, did you get that? God's saying to you, he who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up, up for us all. Shall he not with him also freely give you all things? Say all things. Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It's God who justifies. Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died. And furthermore, is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, peril of sword? As it is written, for your sake, we are all killed all day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet in all these things, we are more than conquerors through Christ or him who loved us. For I'm persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other thing created shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Isn't that an exciting portion of Scripture where it says there are things that will try to come against us, but none of them will be successful. And whatever comes against you, it will not separate you from the love and the nearness of God. And in all these things, say all these things, you are more than a conqueror. So the question is, why is it that we sometimes feel like we get, we lo we're losing and we feel defeated? Amen? And I think it's the way that we approach things. So let me just read you one more scripture and then I'm going to share just three points with you and we're going to shout a shout of victory. 2 Kings chapter 13 is a story of Israel, one of the kings approaching Elisha, the prophet that's on his deathbed uh, at the late stage of his life and he's going to ask him uh, to help them. Elisha had become sick with illness of which he would die. And then Joaz, the king of Israel, came down to him and wept over his face and said, O oh my father, my father, the chariots of Israel and the horsemen. And Elijah said to him, Take a bow and some arrows. So he took himself a bow and some arrows. And then he said to the king of Israel, Put your hand on the bow. So he put his hand on it. And Elijah put his hands on on the king's hands. And he said, open the east window. And he opened it. And Elijah said, shoot. And he shot. And he said, the arrow of the Lord's deliverance and the arrow of deliverance from Syria. For you must strike the Syrians at Apac till you have destroyed them. And then he said, take the arrows. And so he took them. And he said to the king of Israel, strike the ground. And he strike, struck three times and stopped. And the man of God was angry with him. And he said, you should have struck it five or six times. And then you would have stru struck Syria till you had destroyed it. But now you will only strike Syria three times. And then Elijah died and they buried him. And the raiding bands from Moab invaded the space. And they tell you a story about a band of uh, invaders that came to invade. And they hide. They, they threw one guy into, the, into a tomb with where Elijah's bones were and his dead bones resurrected the dead guy. That's some power, isn't it? Hallelujah. But here's a story about Israel in their challenge to sustain and maintain their walk with God. They're up and down, then they're here, then they're there, then they serve God, then they don't. Uh, and uh, it's that time of where they're struggling with some Syrians that are giving them a hard time. And the king realizes that Elijah is on his way out and he goes to visit Elijah not just because he cares about him and has compassion for Elijah, but because he's concerned about Elijah dying and uh, he, he knew that Elijah helped them with all these battles. They would normally go to Elijah and say, please ask God to help us. And Elijah would give them a word or Elisha rather will give them a word and uh, they will do that and get delivered or set free from from their bondage. And so he comes to see him and he says, please, we have got this problem with the Syrians. Will you help us? And Elisha tells him to do what we've just read all about. And I want to talk to you about that this morning, 
about a God that is gracious and full of compassion and a covenant-keeping God. And when we cry out, uh, God steps out and He helps us. There's a difference between us uh, asking God for help because we fear and, and feel challenged and when we repent and turn towards the ways of God. But nevertheless, God is giving an instruction to Elisha for the king so that he can experience deliverance. And I want to just talk to you about that this morning. Many times we preach words, and I trust that we get encouraged by it. We read a word, we get a word from God, whether it's a, in our private time with God, whether it is a prophetic word from someone, whether it is a scripture portion that somebody sends us, and we get encouraged by God, and, and, and then we sit back and we don't do anything to enforce the victory. Are you getting this this morning? To enforce the victory obtained by the cross for us. We can get so stuck in the situation that we expect God and we start begging and pleading with God. And I've been there, you know, and I've been in situations where it almost feels like I don't know what to do. And I beg and plead and hoping that God will do everything. And every time I had a breakthrough, I had to wait for God to speak to me. But he always invited me into the situation with him to participate. Come on now, somebody say amen, please. You can go through the whole New Testament, Old Testament, and you can go and search the Scriptures. I, I find it amazing even when, when God walks into the bath of Bethesda and He finds a man that has been paralyzed for all his life. And Jesus said, what can I do for you? Do you want to walk? And He said, yes, I want to walk. And then He says, says to him, take up your bed and walk. And He says, that's exactly what I can't do. And so Jesus is saying to him, then pull yourself up, crawl on your elbow, uh, but the minute that you show interest in participating, putting your faith in your confidence in me with an action that follows, I'm going to do the supernatural. So, so God is speaking to Elisha, and he's inviting him into a series of unusual steps. Now, now, one of the most amazing things for me is, is that when God gets us involved, He doesn't get us involved with the obvious. What, what do I mean by that? God's action that He requires from us is not the obvious. It's not the logical side of things. It's not what, what I thought I should do to get the result. It's, it's more God wanting to get our attention on Him and seeing whether we would hear, listen to his voice, hear his voice, and obey his voice. And it's not so much whether it makes sense, because God says the foolishness of God is wisdom to man. I want to encourage you this morning that as God invites you into that space and place where you and, and God, and, now, and you need to hear this clearly, where you and God enforces the victory that Jesus obtained on the cross, that you and God enforces the victory that he obtained on the cross through you and me intentionally obeying what he tells us to do, even if it doesn't always make sense. So Elisha is saying to the king, he says, listen, I want you to take a bow and arrow. Now already that doesn't make sense, standing in a bedroom with a bow and arrow. So he says to him, take a bow and arrow and then I want you, to, put your, uh, I want you to, sh to pull the arrow and shoot the arrow. But before he shoots the arrow, um, Elisha puts his hands on the hands of the king. And I want to say this morning to you, now, you, you, you know, and I, I feel God's doing something in our midst, in our town, in our nation, where he's going to display his glory and his life in a way that we've not seen before. Uh, and, and one of the worst things that we can do is look at the natural, like I said last Sunday, when, when we look at the situation around us and darkness covers the earth and gross darkness, the people, and God says, still I want you to arise for my power will come upon you and then your light is going to shine and make a difference. It doesn't make sense because it's not just about our physical well-being about financial success and outcomes. It is about 
kingdom outcomes and the fact that we are carriers of the good news of Jesus Christ so that all will come to know the power and the glory and the saving grace of God. Amen? So God is calling us, and I want to say this to you in, conju in, in, in conjunction with last Sunday's word, God is still calling you and me as Christians to arise. And one of the things that can get us is that fear and anxiety and uncertainty and tiredness can so paralyze us that we sit there expecting God to do everything and not engage and arise with God. I wonder what God is calling you to arise in this morning. I wonder what God is calling you to arise in in your family, which has kind of paralyzed you and manipulated you and confronted you in such a way that you at times didn't know what to do. And God is calling you to arise and get your bow and arrows. He says, and the action that Elisha takes is a prophetic statement, just like we shared if, again last week when God said to, to, to Isaiah, prophesy, arise, shine. God is saying, before you do anything, there will be supernatural intervention. You know, I find that in my life oftentimes that when I'm in a difficult situation, I try everything that I think I should do before I consult God or wait on God for the supernatural touch, the empowerment or enabling power or anointing of God on my life. And I find that whatever I do, it doesn't matter how much it makes sense, how hard I try, it comes short because we can only conquer through the divine enabling power and touch from God. He tells the king to shoot the arrow um, out of the east window and it's funny, these things, you know, sometimes in the Bible I read things that doesn't make sense to me. I wonder why it was out of the east window. And I, yesterday as I worked through the Word again and just revisited the Word, I thought, well, not too much that I can say about the east window. Um, and as I started reading other portions of Scripture, the Holy Spirit started re leading me to different portions of Scriptures concerning the arrows, and I ended up reading this scripture in Isaiah, uh, uh, rather in Ezekiel chapter 43. Have you got that on? Ezekiel 43 verse 1 to 4, it says, And afterwards he brought me to the gate, the gate that faces towards the east. And behold, the glory of the God of Israel came from the way of the east. His voice was like the sound of many waters, and the earth shone with his glory. Isn't that powerful? Now if you continue to read that, have you got the rest of the scripture there as well? And it was like the appearance of the vision which I saw, like the vision which I saw when all came to destroy the city. The vision were like the vision which I saw by the river Seba. And I fell on my face, and the glory of the Lord came into the temple by the way, by the gate which faces towards the east. And God was saying through Elisha to the king, your deliverance is not coming through where you think it's coming from. Your deliverance is coming from God. You know, church, I think when we go through hardship and difficulty and the, we get pressurized by circumstances and situation, the tendency is to look around to people, looking around to situations, to, to, to authorities, people around us that we think can get us out of the situation, should do it for us. And... Um, and over the past few years, I've realized afresh that the season that we're in, the time that we're in upon the face of the earth, it is our responsibility to really look completely and solely to God for our deliverance. Amen? God is calling you and me and say to us, I want you to set your eyes and fix your eyes on me for your deliverance is coming from nowhere else but from God. I think the other thing that God is saying to us as we, as we shoot the arrow of deliverance is God is, as we cry out for God's deliverance and He's calling us to rise and shine and shoot the arrow of deliverance, the arrow has got something to do with reach. You know, if you fight with a sword, you keep it in your hand and, it, and you stay within distance from people. The arrow of deliverance has got to do with your reach. Over the last <clears throat> few weeks as I'm praying and consulting God in the way forward and the way that we uh, working out where God's taking us, I, I constantly speaks to me as I'm talking to him about my life. He keeps on talking to me about the kingdom, the city, and the nations. 
Isn't that amazing? And God is saying to you, I want you to know that the deliverance that you're looking for, I'm not bringing to you until you see the effect it's going to have on your neighborhood, on your city, and the arena that I've placed you in. So long before we get our personal conviction or personal deliverance and freedom, God wants us to shoot an arrow of deliverance out of the east window far away from ourselves. God is saying, listen, I want to establish whatever I'm going to do in you, also through you, beyond you. And God is saying to Elisha, Elisha, tell the king to shoot, not just to trust for his own deliverance and freedom, not just to trust God for his own ministry, for his own um, liberty and freedom, but to shoot the arrow of deliverance far beyond himself. And uh, Elisha, um, and the king shoots the arrow of deliverance out of the east window. And then the king, uh, Elisha did a, an amazing thing. He said to him, after he shot the arrow, he said to him, I want you to, to hit the ground, strike the ground. And, Elijah st- and, and the king struck the ground three times, and Elisha was, was angry with him after he struck it three times, not giving him any instruction on how many times he should, should hit the arrow on the ground. Uh, he's, he's mad at him. He's upset with him. And, and, and uh, it's, it's an amazing thing. Why would um, Elisha be upset with the king for striking the ground only three times? And I want to say to you this morning, uh, I believe there are several reasons why because he actually says that ultimately. He says, uh, because you struck it three times, you'll only have three victories. And, and I wonder whether you have struck your arrow of deliverance only three times when God has called you to struck, strike it more than three times. I think we, we sometimes stop striking. And when I say strike, and I'm going to talk to you about it just now. When we say we strike the arrow, when, we, when God wants to bring deliverance to us, He also wants to bring deliverance through us. That the call of God for us to arise and to participate is not just for our own freedom and liberty. It is beyond us. It's a reach far beyond us. And sometimes we strike the arrow just three times because that's the bare minimum that I should do. Sometimes it's a religious mindset that we have. Is if, if you tell me to strike the, the ground, I'll strike it three times, and, and then that's that. Maybe there's not a hunger and a thirst for more. Maybe it's because there's a religious mindset or a selfish mindset. Sometimes we, we and I believe that's why God's wrestling with us to say, I want you to know this arise, shine, is far more than you just breaking through in your own personal life. So sometimes we strike the ground and, and three is maybe just me, my wife, and my children. And God says, no, no, I want you to know that I've called you for generations. I want you to strike the ground for you and for your children and for your children's children. That's why I want you to know that we can't give up or give in just the first time that we experience resistance. That's why we contend for much more than getting together in a nice word and being encouraged ourselves. That's why we believe God for much more than just for healing for ourselves. That's why we believe God for much more than just uh, um, our children being in the school uh, or our children going in the gap year. It's for generations upon generations. That's why we're contending for a value system uh, and a culture that reaches far beyond and leave a legacy that our children's children will be grateful for because we hit the arrow more than three times. Listen to what, what uh, the psalmist says in Psalm 127. Have you got it for me? Psalm 127, 4 and 5. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior, so are the children of one's youth. Happy is the man who has his quiver full of them. They shall not be ashamed, but shall speak with their enemies in the gates. When I read the Word of God, God has never ever rebuked anybody because they had too much faith. Never. He never said to the young boy, Jesus never said to the young boy, how do you expect me to do this 
feed all these people with two fish and five loaves. You are asking for too much. I believe that God's calling us to not just ask Him for our own personal deliverance and freedom, for our own personal breakthrough, but to stand up again and arise and say, Lord, I've got an arrow to shoot. I've got something to, to participate. I, I want to participate in what you're doing and where you're going with the kingdom of God, and I'm ready to rise up and strike the ground again and again and again and not give up and not give in. I know that there's a generation coming after me that needs to have experienced the full impact of the power of God and the kingdom of God. So how do I shoot my arrow? I'm closing with this this morning and we're going to worship God. How do I shoot my arrow? Listen to this. In Psalm, <clears throat> in Psalm 64, It says this, oppressed by the wicked is the heading of the psalm. Hear my voice, O God, in my meditation. Preserve my life from fear of the enemy. Hide me from the secret plots of the wicked, from the rebellion of the workers of iniquity, who sharpen their tongue like a sword and bend their bows to shoot their arrows of bitter words that they may shoot in secret at the blameless. Suddenly they shoot at him and do not fear. They encourage themselves in an evil matter. They talk of laying snares secretly. They say, who will see them? They devise iniquities. We have perfected a shrewd scheme. Both the inward thought and the heart of man are deep. But God shall shoot at them with an arrow. Suddenly they shall be wounded. So he will make them stumble over their own tongue. All who see them shall flee away. All men shall fear God and shall declare that the, the work of God. I really believe that God is inviting us into a time where he wants to bring about change and he's inviting us into a space and place to arise and shoot arrows of deliverance. I believe that the arrows of deliverance is coming through the words that we speak. And I want to say this to you this morning, that we will not have the victory by merely believing what Jesus has done on the cross for us and asking for him to enforce what he's done on the cross for us, but by us speaking the word that God puts in our mouths over ourselves, our family, our neighborhood, our children and our children's children. I believe that for us to rise, we need to take on the Word of God and receive the Word of God. I, I believe that God wants us to take action. I wonder what action God wants you to take so that you don't just sit and believe for an arrow of deliverance, but participate in shooting the arrow of deliverance for yourself, for your marriage, for your children, for your business, and for our area. And for that, God is saying, listen, I want you to hear the word. And I want you just to close your eyes for a moment because I'm going to ask God to speak to you again like last week. God, what are you saying to me? <clears throat> at this moment in time, so that I can arise with you be empowered by the Spirit of God for my situation whether it is in my business whether it is in a relationship whether it is for my marriage whether it's something that God calls you to establish in this community that looks so much bigger than you so much greater than you and, and maybe at the time you reach the point where you feel discouraged and despondent and felt like maybe I need to stop striking in prayer, stop asking, stop believing. And God says, don't stop. Don't stop believing me for an outcome. Don't quit. Don't give up. Keep on striking the ground with an arrow of faith 
believing that God can change the impossible and do the impossible. Maybe you've given up on yourself and your purpose in the kingdom. Maybe what you feel God's calling you is beyond your financial ability and capacity. And God is saying, keep on striking the ground because I want to raise you up and I want to shoot with you. The word that I've given you is a word from God. And what I'm calling you to do is beyond yourself. It's not just for your own comfort, your own success. But for the outworking of the kingdom of God for generations to come. God wants to give you a word. He wants to speak a word to you that is not a second-hand word. It's not just a word that you casually heard from somebody else, but a word that has come to you from his mouth, from his heart. And maybe you're sitting here this morning and you say, God, I don't know how I'm going to do this. And God says, just stand still. And let me put my hands upon you. Let me put my anointing, my divine enabling power on you. Let me enable you. Let me anoint you. And then take the step of obedience that I'm requiring from you. Then even if looks and, and sometimes doesn't make sense, would you obey and take the first step of what I'm speaking to you and then speak life? That the arrow that comes out of your mouth is not self-condemnation, self-judgment, not cynicism, skepticism, criticism. We live in a day and a time where what we see around us is very difficult not to fall into the trap of opinions and saying things that are negative and doubt and unbelief and opposite of what God wants to accomplish through you and me as we lay hold in God's word, lay hold of us, lay hold of us, and we shoot arrows of deliverance through the power of God. And it comes first of all through what we say and then in obedience what we do. Even though the victory is, in the, is the Lord's, we are still called to be warriors in His kingdom and to fight the good fight of faith. Father, this morning, I just want you to sit like that and open your heart to receive. God wants to touch you this morning in all simplicity. God wants to speak a word to you that cuts through fear and anxiety and uncertainty and skepticism and cynicism. But God wants you to participate and engage with Him in a process of obedience and what comes out of your mouth. For by the word of God, the worlds were formed and shaped. Life and death is in the power of the tongue. And we know that we've heard the word, speak the word, when the action that follows is the action of humility and obedience. Father, this morning I pray for us as a community, for us as a church, that we will arise in Jesus' name. They will not wait for somebody else. They will not beg and plead for you to do what you've already done, but that we will participate and engage with you as you, by your grace, anoint us and enable us through the power of the Spirit. Put words in our heart and that we will in all humility obey so that we will see the kingdom of God advance, the gospel of the kingdom, the good news of the kingdom take root in hearts because we were willing to step out and shoot the arrow of deliverance. And see the harvest come in that you've called for calling for in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. I want us to stand. There are many more things to be done in this city. The good news is that God has already got the victory for us in Christ Jesus. The challenge is He's calling you, not the pastor, you. 
and there's within you invested kingdom gifting, kingdom ability, anointing to make a difference when we allow God to touch us and shoot the arrow of deliverance. God bless you. Amen.